Welcome to another episode of Legendary. This episode is very dear to my heart uh, personally because when I was living in Kuwait and working a nine to five uh, corporate job, I decided to quit my job and pursue my goals. I was unfulfilled, I was looking for a purpose, I was looking for meaning, and two things got me through it. Uh, the first thing was a book called Mastery by Robert Greene, and the second was a gentleman's TED talk that was about taking a leap of faith, following your gut, and the gentleman is right next to me here today, the urban outlaw, the one and only Magnus Walker. Magnus, thank you so much. Hey for man, us. welcome thank to the you. warehouse. Thank, thank you, you very appreciate much for it. the thank opportunity. You. Thank you. So the first question I always ask is who is Magnus Walker? I grew up a working class background in Sheffield, England. My father was a, a salesman for some automotive parts company and my mum was like a relief teacher at school. Um, my Porsche story, because you know, who is Magnus Walker? I'm a guy with a beard, but I'm also a clothing designer. I'm in the, in the film location business and I've had a love affair with Porsche for over 40 years. So if you don't mind taking us back to your early childhood in Sheffield, England, um, and, and walk us through how Magnus Walker bega be became who he is today. My dad introduced me to motorsports and in the mid 70s, 1976, England had James Hunt, Formula One world champion and Barry Sheen, motorbike world champion. So I grew up watching a lot of motorsports on TV. Uh, Sheffield is about 180 miles north of London. Back then, 40 years ago, it was like a, an epic journey for me to actually go to London ended up taking a coach down to London and uh, going to that London Olds Court Motor Show. So that left a big impression because it was the start of a journey to go to a car show that I'd never gone to. Ironically, my dad's father was a car salesman in the late 60s. So I guess it had always sort of been in my blood, the automobile and transportation, even though I didn't really grow up with a car in the family. So I'd come back from London with this vision of this car and some glossy brochures of what was current then. Of course, the turbo was the iconic Porsche. I wrote a letter to him saying, hey, I want a design for you. And they actually wrote me a letter back, believe it or not, saying essentially, thanks for your interest, but call us when you're older. I'm sure you can relate to that <laughs> as a, a car designer yourself. And so that left a real impression for me. I had the poster on the wall and I just never gave up on that dream. And that dream finally came true in 1992 when I was 25. By that time, I'd moved to LA. But there was something memorable about acquiring my very first Porsche. That wasn't my first car. Because in England, like I say, working class background, didn't have a car. I didn't even have a driver's license in England. I used to take the bus everywhere. And back then, you could take the bus literally for five pence. So the concept of owning a car was something that was really foreign to me. So I should tell you, the first car I ever bought was in 1988. I came to LA in 1986 when I was 19, and we'll get into that later, the summer camp thing with kids. Camp but America. To, yeah, to sort of finish up on the car thing, fell in love with Porsche when I was 10, moved to America when I was 19 in 86. By 1988, I actually bought my first car, which was a 1977 Toyota Corolla 2TC that I paid 200 bucks for. And I drove that around for probably nine months without a driver's license or insurance. I guess it was the beginning of the early outlaw days, you know. I didn't care, I was rebellious. Second car I ever bought was a 1988 Saab 900 SPG Turbo, and that was probably in 1991. And the third car I ever bought was my first Porsche. And it was a slant nose conversion that I bought at the Pomona Swap Meet in 1992, so 26 years ago. And that was really special, as special as the Toyota was, because that was my first sense of mobility and freedom. And living in LA, you really need a car. But there was something really special for me about buying that first Porsche. It was a 1974 slant nose conversion wide body. I paid 7,500 bucks for it at the Pomona Swamp Meet. And it was 15 years after I'd fallen in love with Porsche. So that really represented a dream come true and a sense of personal achievement and accomplishment because I never thought I'd own one. Since then, I've owned a lot more, but um, that's kind of a long answer to who I am and at least the beginning of what I like to call my crazy Porsche collection out of control hobby, which has sort of fueled my life for the past 40 years. That was a bit of a gutsy move for a young kid in England to write a letter to Porsche. What was the motive behind that letter? It kind of just seemed natural, you know. I came back from that show with those color brochures, like I said. I had the poster on the wall. 
There was an address on the back of it. Might have just said Porsche Zuffenhaus in Stuttgart, Germany. Yeah. And I wrote to her and there was just, like I say, something, I just felt I needed to write. And it's funny, I don't really write. I left school at 15 with not a lot of education. But at the time, you know, I was drawing and doodling around and it just seemed like I needed to, to get it out, I guess. And it was a real surprise that they wrote back. You know, I guess then Porsche was a lot smaller than they are today, 40 right. years later. But I will tell you full circle, I've done quite a lot of stuff with Porsche over the past five years since Timir Moscovici's film Urban Outlaw came out, which has changed both our lives. And I'd like to talk about that in more detail. But to expand upon riding to Porsche, I was recently at Porsche. I visit them quite a few times. And uh, it was like a real trip down memory lane for me because I was walking around, I think it was a press or PR department, and I saw on one person's workstation there was a letter that someone had wrote to them. And I actually took a photo of it because I'm like, wow, that was me 40 years ago. And people are still writing letters to Porsche. And I said to this person, you know, when you write back to this person, it's probably going to change their lives. You don't know how impactful this is. Encouragement from Porsche is that you're going to take the time to write a letter back. Because it happened to me 40 years ago. And it's almost emotional thinking about it now that I actually saw that letter. I don't know who wrote it. But it was yeah. like, wow, I was in that position 40 years ago. And the fact that in today's age when no one really writes, everyone gets out the phone and texts and emails, right? That someone had taken the time to write a handwritten letter. And it happens to me all the time. Literally yesterday I got a letter from, people write to me all the time, email. But I physically received a letter from a father who told me a story about how his son had watched Urban Outlaw and this kid had uh, left school like I did. He'd been doing odd jobs, working as a caddy on a golf course and saved up enough money to buy his first Porsche. And his father had sent me this letter, which was hand signed with a return address envelope. And it was a photo of his son that the son didn't know the father had taken on the day that he picked up his first Porsche and he was washing the car. Father had taken a photo of the son washing his first Porsche, sent it to me to sign, included a self-addressed envelope and just said, can you put some inspiring words or motivational words on this photo for my son? It'll mean a lot. Oh. And so it's sort of like my way of giving back because I believe that's my relatability. I'm no different to anyone else. I left school at 15 in England with two O levels, never gave up on my dream. And now the fact that in some way my story is relatable to people and inspiring people to do their own thing. I think you can probably relate yeah. to that. Yeah. That for me, it's a sense of giving back. You know, for me, my Porsche collection's always been about, well, life has always been about doing what I love to do. So that's the story with the letter writing process. So to everyone out there that's watching, I encourage you, if you believe strongly in something, to write a letter to whoever it may be, because those letters do go noticed, they do get replied to, and I believe they do actually have an impact and can change the course of someone's life. So Absolutely. the art of letter writing has never gone out of style. I joke about, you know, books are making a comeback even though I don't read. But um, it's that whole process of, for me, it's rewarding to, to be part of that process. It's funny that you mentioned that because if I, I actually wrote you twice in the last uh, year. And, it, and, I, and I wrote you, I think, around 3 a.m that I was looking on your Instagram, you're in New York, and I decided I'm gonna write another email and I wanna get that interview. And I remember I was having dinner right across the street at Bestia, uh, probably like a couple of weeks ago. And I was with a friend and I, and I looked and I said, this, somewhere here there's a warehouse of, of a person that has inspired me to make that trip back to California to live here and pursue my goals. And I, I'm gonna sit down with this individual and be able to learn from him and pick his brain. Um, so. That just goes to show that if you take initiative, you never know what's going to happen. Timing's everything. When things are meant to happen, they happen yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. Like this sort of happened within the past 48 hours and here you are. Yeah. And to me, things in my life have happened organically. And I think that's something we can talk about. You know, you can't really plan your life and your future and your destiny. Some people can, but there's a certain person like myself where I don't work on a schedule. You know, you'd always get these people that say to you as a kid, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, these career goals. And I don't, back at the time, I didn't care where I was going to be the next day. And to a certain degree, I'm kind of like that still. There is no business model, five, 10 year goal plan for me. I do things that just, back to the TED talk, go on gut feeling. Yeah. They either feel right or they don't. And timing is a perfect example of that. I think things happen organically for me or have happened organically for me at a certain time, 
and you can't really plan that. It's, I guess it's just sometimes the, the way the stars align, you know. Right. There's been a lot of elements in my life that were never planned, like moving to America wasn't planned. Still being in America 32 years wasn't planned. You know, those early years were a struggle for me. But I never gave up on pursuing my passion. And ultimately, I think doing things that you enjoy and love, you put all that hard work and dedication in, all that time in, hours don't mean anything, you know. Passion's not a nine to five job. It's something that's all consuming. It could happen at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, 18, right. 20 hour days. You know, when you're on that, that quest, it's never ending, you know, right. time's irrelevant. I want to back up a little bit. I spoke about writing that letter to Portia as a 10 year old, and then I s stopped the story and fast forward. So I went to college, got this education in sports management. I did soccer coaching, swimming coaching, uh, Red Cross medallion stuff. And that was where I found out about Camp America. I'd never heard of Camp America. And essentially what it is, is you go work on a summer camp with kids and spend the summer in the States. So in 1986, at the age of 19, I came to America, flew from London, I took a bus from Sheffield, train from Sheffield to London, flew from London to New York, had one night in New York, and then got on a Trailways bus to nowhere, which turned out to be Detroit, or at least a summer camp on Lake Michigan, about 30 minutes north of Detroit. And uh, back then, I still believe to this day, the summer camps fall into two categories, underprivileged inner city kids, or these kind of private camps for wealthy people. And of course, I got a camp which was for under city, uh, underprivileged inner city kids north of Detroit. And it was great. It was a great learning experience on how I became what I call an adaptive swimmer because it was an environment that I was not familiar with. I'd grown up in working class town, but in a sense, Detroit's a working class town that had fallen on hard times. You know, at the time, it didn't really register with me, but Detroit, Motor City, the birthplace of the American automotive uh, yeah. industry, and also the birthplace of Motown Soul, Iggy and the Stooges, MC5, Alice Cooper, and rock and roll. So it had a lot of similarities to Sheffield, even though back then most of the kids that were on the summer camp were listening to Run DMC and LL Cool J. So that was an environment that I wasn't used to musically and an environment environmentally that I was not necessarily used to. So I became an adaptive swimmer. And by that, I mean, I had no background in that environment, but you sink or swim. You sort of learn to survive. It's a human instinct, you know, yeah. you learn to survive. And so spent the summer on that camp and then uh, took a trailways bus from Detroit to LA, arrived literally about a mile and a half north of where we sat at Union Station at 5 a.m. in the morning, groggy eyed, and I get out of the bus and actually fell asleep on a bench and then got woken up by a cop at 5 a.m. telling me I couldn't be sleeping here at the uh, trailways station at Union Station, the bus station. And it was strange because it was a little anticlimactic. I'd grown up watching all this American TV, which I think people do all over the world. You know, it's, uh, I watched shows, Dukes of Hazard, Chips, Rockford Files, and I was into American music. It was a heyday of Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue. And my vision of LA was that, but the Trailway Station at Union Station yeah. is a different version of LA. And it was anticlimactic to begin with. It was like, we're all the beautiful people. We're all the rock stars, you know, we're all the movie stars. So that was my awakening to LA and uh, my cousin and I had taken that bus from Detroit to LA ended up staying at a YMCA youth hostel off of Hollywood Boulevard. And that was where I ended up buying those pants for $9.99, one pair, went back to the YMCA, made them tight, went down Melrose, accidentally walked into that store called Retail Slut, met Tammy who was in this band called Faster Pussycat who was working there, struck up a conversation. He said, hey, cool pants, where'd you get them? I said, London, even though I hadn't, it just flashed like that. I hadn't even thought about selling them. Remember, I paid nine ninety nine for them. He said, well, how much, Charlie? The first figure that came to my mind was $25. I said, well, you want to buy some? He said, yeah, I'll take eight pairs, 130, 232, 234s, 136. I didn't even really have the money to buy the pants. My cousin loaned me the money. Yeah. We went back to Hollywood Boulevard, bought them, went back to him, sold them for $15 profit. And we're like, wow. Maybe this LA thing is going to work out for me after all. So I ended up staying in LA for three months, overstayed my visa, and then went back to England almost December of 86. And to me, that was, it felt like failure because I hadn't actually managed to stay in LA. So I went back to England defeated, almost like with my tail between my legs, because I'd had a sense, this taste of freedom, 
but I hadn't grasped it. You know, I wasn't able to sort of succeed at it. So I was in England for six months and it was really depressing because by that time I'd experienced LA and LA was in my heart all of a sudden, that's where I want to be. You know, that is my future. That's the place I related to. And I applied back to Camp, Camp America for a second time and actually got denied. It was a real shock. I'm like, <laughs> well, I was there last year. How come you don't have a space for me this year? So they, they denied my first application saying they didn't have a space for me on a summer camp. And that, that was like a, a double blow because I was fully expecting to go back. And then out of the blue, probably a month later, they wrote me or called me literally on a Tuesday and said, we found a space for you in New Jersey. Can you leave on Friday? And I wasn't working at the time. I think I literally, I think I had a hundred pounds to my name. And I said, sure, that was it. So I came back 87, like June of 87. And I've been here 31 years later, never, never left. I mean, it's really changed my life. I mean, in a sense, I'm more Americanized than I'm English because I've been here almost 32 years, 31 years. I spent 19 years in England. So all my sort of adult responsibility has happened in America. It's happened in LA. Yeah. I guess I'm the classic case of uh, Angelino of, you know, came here with nothing and sort of enjoyed life and had some success. But all my adult responsibility, i.e., you know, owning something, employing people, working myself, paying taxes, having an apartment, a bank account, a social security number, a car. I actually never had any of that in England. What strikes me as shocking, weren't you afraid? I mean, you say you went back to England and, and to you it was a failure. But then again, when you were here in LA, there was nothing to look forward to, to be exact, right? There was no plan at the time. There was no plan, but LA represented freedom. Sheffield, I was still living with my mom and dad, you know, mm -hmm. at 19, that didn't represent freedom. That was sort of restricted. You know, I was living under someone else's roof by their, those rules. And growing up as a kid, you know, into heavy metal, I obviously had this somewhat rebellious nature and so for me what I love about LA is whatever you want to do here you can there's an opportunity and an environment to pursue that dream I spoke about it before music fashion automotive aerospace whatever you want to do no one judges you in LA by the way you look your background your educational background what you sound like England 40 years ago and still to this day is more class divided depending on where you come from, what you sound like and what you look like. Mm -hmm. So those opportunities are not, they're not as available. Within 50 miles of where we're sat right now, if you want to build cars or planes or whatever it may be, that opportunity is there. The accessibility to shops that actually make things is here. And that's been in LA since the 30s, 40s and 50s, you know, aerospace industry, hot rodding of cars in the late 50s. So to me, LA had always been, it wasn't scary to me because everything I knew I liked was here. Moving to LA before serious clothing, before anything started to become tangible for you and see a plan ahead, did you face doubt? If so, how did you deal with it? I didn't face doubt to begin with. You know, there's what I call the first sort of two years of sex, drugs, rock and roll, when LA was great. You know, I'm 1920. It was a different era back then. It was pre-cell phone, so things were in a way more organic, less planned. Um, for me, it was an easy lifestyle. The first year I was going out to a lot of clubs. It was easy to get around. You know, I actually didn't need much money to survive. I was couch surfing, living on people's floors and stuff like that, going to nightclubs for free, getting in drinks and stuff like that. So probably the first 18 months was just pure fun. And then the novelty started to wear off a little bit. And it was like, well, what am I doing here, you know? By that time, I'm 21-ish. And it was sort of like, well, it's getting a little old, a little boring. And that was when the doubt started creeping in because I hadn't formed the, I wasn't really working, occasional odd jobs. So it was sort of that, the novelty of going out all the time, rock and roll dream was wearing off. And the purpose of life's questions started coming through as to how am I gonna occupy my time? and what is gonna motivate me to stay here. So there was a period of probably, this was 89, 1990, when there was doubt. Wow, am I gonna be able to cut it in LA? You know, I didn't have a job. There was nothing I was passionate about. And yet again, I use the word organic. 
I happened to be down in Venice Beach, walking down the boardwalk, and a lot of market stalls back then, sort of like Camden Market in England. And Venice to this day is still pretty similar, even though it's been a lot more gentrified. And an English guy came up to me who was working at this stall selling seconds from The Gap. And somehow I guess I'd stood out or he'd heard my accent or something, because I actually wasn't shopping in this little booth. And for those that don't know, Venice Beach is all cheap sunglasses and socks on one side. And on the other side of the boardwalk, the ocean side, it's artisans. And back then it was a lot of sort of hippie, grateful dead people making artsy type stuff and selling it on the boardwalk. And this guy came up to me and said, hey, are you English or are you looking for work? I guess they were looking for someone to man this booth. And I said, yeah, I'm English, you know, yeah, I'll take a, a job. What does it pay? And I think it was something like, might have been $10 a day. And this was just on a Saturday and Sunday. And I said, sure, I'll do it because I needed money and I hadn't thought much beyond that. And so I took that job and that kind of changed my life in the sense because I'd never really thought about a job in sales but I guess I was quite good at it because I was able to sort of talk to people. You know, I think that's what the English are great at, you know, actually not so much selling themselves, but conversating as they talk about it, as I say. Connecting with people, yeah. And so Venice Beach was a great connector. It still is because it's a great tourist attraction. Hundreds of thousands of people over the weekend would go down Venice Beach. You know, it's like Disneyland and Venice Beach. Those were the places that you'd go to. So that job on the market stall, sort of was my first introduction to really dealing with the public in a sales way. And one important thing, well, a few important things came from it, but one of the more memorable ones was, I remember there was a guy who had a stall a few doors down who was selling vintage clothing. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I could actually sew, my mum sewed, and you know, my extent of sewing was making my jeans as tight as possible when I was into heavy metal, which I still am, and sewing patches on my denim jacket. So there was a little spark of, oh, this guy's selling old Levi's. And so I basically did something very similar, but with a big difference to it is, I'd go to yard sales and buy these old 501s for nothing, 50 cents, a dollar, a dollar 50. But what I did was I started putting patches on them, which is what I'd done as a kid. I mean, I'm still only 20, 21 at this stage. So I'd buy these old Paisley shirts, cut them up and sew patches on the jeans. And that was how I got into the clothing business was purely organically by accident on the boardwalk in Venice. And I remember renting a stall, my own stall during the week for $10 a day. And I think the first day I was there, I might have made 30 or $40 selling old vintage stuff. And then before you know it, it was $50 and then $100. And that thing grew pretty quickly. And then I started selling these or I noticed there was a Guatemalan store and they had these sort of Guatemalan tams in woven Guatemalan fabric. I thought, oh, they're kind of cool. So I bought one, took it apart, essentially was inspired by it, copied it to a certain degree, but made it in different fabric. Instead of Guatemalan fabric, I'd cut up an old velvet dress, and then instead of putting a black lining on it, I put a paisley lining on it. I said, oh, this thing's reversible. It's two hats in one. So all of a sudden, I'm like in the hat business. It was literally a big round circle with a band that got pleated in, and I think we were selling them for $20. Sold a few, and then sold a few more, and before you know it, we couldn't make them fast enough. And this was probably 1990. And a couple of things were happening then. There was a whole rave scene happening. You know, you're what, 26? 26. So, you know, you're not even really around at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and so the rave scene's happening. And yeah. the rave scene was great because all these UK DJs were coming over. I wasn't really into the rave scene, but the rave scene sort of overlapped with this Burning Man slash Grateful Dead slash hippie, Black Crow's Southern Rock thing that I was into. So it was this mishmash of style, like 60s Janis Joplin, Doors, Rolling Stones, Hippie, mixed in with this psychedelic rave culture. And these people liked to party. They liked colorful patched work overalls and jeans. And I remember one day we were selling these hats on the boardwalk and someone came up to me and said, can you make a cat in the hat hat? I'm like, I don't even know what a cat in the hat hat is. And they go, oh, Dr. Zeus, this writer, wrote a book, and it's his character wearing a hat. So I got the book, looked at the picture, and thought, well, this really can't be that hard to make. So I made a cat in the hat hat, sold it on the boardwalk. This person came and bought it, and then made a few more, and then developed a hat line based on these whimsical characters like Lewis Carroll's Mad Hatter, Alice in Wonderland. Then we had a court jester hat and these floppy big Applejack hats. and. We were making them an apartment in Venice, selling them on the boardwalk, and then one day 
We went down to Melrose Avenue, which was the shopping street. Ironically, this street where probably six, seven years earlier, I'd sold those pants to Tammy. And so all of a sudden, we started wholesaling these hats. Then we did a trade show in New York. The very first trade show we ever did, and this is all within a nine-month period of starting this wow. booth on the boardwalk. We got an order from Disneyland, theme parks, and they bought 144 of every style of hat we had and we had 12 styles of hats in four different colors. So this was a huge order for us. And then, when, then the next... And you, and you were 22 by this point? Wow. 23. So it's 1990, yeah. so I'm 23. And so we couldn't make them quick enough, so we actually had to go find a hat contractor who wasn't used to sewing these type of hats, teach them how to sew the hats, and we started wholesaling. Then we sold Universal, Six Flags, Magic Mountain, all these theme parks, started buying these hats. So we'd gone from selling one hat, five hats, 10 hats, 20 hats on the boardwalk to all of a sudden we're making a thousand of a style and we're in the hat business. So by that point, the patchwork jeans was sort of dying down because that was labor intensive and getting harder to find. And we started wholesaling hats all over and that was how we got into the wholesale clothing business probably in 1991. I talk about my 30 plus years in LA. I've done three things. The clothing company, which we've just talked about a little bit. Uh, I bought this building 18 years ago, I accidentally got into the film location business, which we'll talk about. The film location business enabled me the finances to own more Porsches than I ever thought I'd own. But the thread that connects all three things together, the clothing design, the property development, and the Porsches that I've built and designed, they've all got their own artistic style, which is my style. It's my interpretation of what I'm inspired by. And each one had its own unique look. From that start on the boardwalk in Venice, that grew into serious clothing, which was pretty successful for over a dozen years. That enabled us to buy this building. When we bought this building, people thought we were crazy because 18 years ago, the arts district in LA is not nearly as trendy and desirable as it is today, but we didn't care what other people thought. Same with the Porsches that I built for myself. So I've got this sport purpose, streetable track vibe, which is not everyone's taste, but for me, it's never about making other people happy. It's about finding inner peace and making myself happy. So that's the common thread that's connected three things that I have no education in, fashion, property development, car design. I have no background in those, but I have a passion for each one. And it's something that I enjoy doing and it's something that I sort of taught myself, obviously asked a lot of questions and had help along the way, but it's something that I'd always believed in and that I enjoyed doing. And it's kind of a simple lesson. The hard part is finding something that you enjoy doing, because as I just told you, I didn't think I'd get in the clothing business. That happened purely organically. But I think there comes a moment when opportunity presents itself, and you either move forward with it, or, or you turn and walk away. It's like a lot of people, I tell this story all the time, you know, it's like everyone has ideas, but not everyone pursues those ideas. Those ideas sometimes are turned down because you'll say to your friend, yeah, I've got this great idea, I want to do blah, blah, blah. And your friend may go, well, that's a stupid idea. And you go, okay, I won't bother. Or he'll go, that's a great idea. You should pursue it. For me, I, being sort of a lone wolf character coming to America at an early age, not having any family here, I always relied on gut feeling. Does it feel right or not? You know, sometimes it feels scary, like how are you going to do this? And that's kind of the way you got to go, I believe. If it feels scary, but yet you want to do it, you just keep moving towards it and never give up on it. And that's what LA taught me. So Magnus, you said that you have to find what it is you're passionate about. A lot of people spend a lot of time, possibly their, their lifetimes, looking for something that they're passionate about to, to, to be able to find their purpose in life. How does one come to find their passion? I think ultimately people enjoy doing certain things, but don't necessarily think there's a future in that or you know, a, a sustainability in that. For me, not really having an idea of a future, those things happened organically, but how do you find your passion? I don't know, it just has to come from within, it has to feel right. I think it's within everyone in the heart, the soul and the gut, ultimately I think is where those ideas brew. It's just a matter of do you follow them or not. Has there been a time where you followed your gut and failed? When it became difficult for me was probably two, three years in, when a lot of people had copied what I was doing, went overseas and made it cheaper. That was when sales started dwindling. So to begin with, the first three years, I had a little company called Venetian Paradise. I was in Venice, 
I was, it was paradise. It was pretty easy. Venetian, someone lives in Venice. Wow, this life's paradise. It was Venetian paradise. And so that was the patchwork jeans and the Mad Hatter hats. Now, as I just said, those things got knocked off. So instead of us selling them for $22, people were mass producing them in China and selling them for, I don't know, five, six, seven dollars. They weren't handmade no more. So all those big orders that I had with Disneyland, they all disappeared and sales really peaked. But the funny thing is, the next door opened organically and it happened like this. There was a rapper that came up to me on the boardwalk in Venice and I'm not a rap fan, I'm a heavy metal fan, but obviously those styles collide or, or that attitude collides a little bit. And this guy wanted me to make him something out of velvet and I ended up making this sort of crazy patchwork hoodie out of velvet. And he said, oh, that's some serious shit you've got there. I was like, serious shit, wow, serious. That's what we're gonna call. We needed to break away from the identity of Venetian paradise because it had become old hat. Like, you know, what we were doing wasn't trendy anymore and how do you separate, disconnect and move on? Well, we had to rebrand, so we were sort of moving out of the patchwork hats and patchwork jeans and all that stuff and moving into the rock and roll cut and sew thing. But we needed a new identity. And that one little spark of that rapper going, oh, that's some serious shit. That was the birth of serious clothing. Wow. 1994. So, you know, 24 years ago. Yeah. And then serious clothing had a great run for the next 10, 12 years because we sold this little chain that we'd sold when we were doing the hats called Hot Topic when they had five stores. Yeah. Um, they grew to over 700 stores and we grew with them. So that was where the volume came. So, you know, there was a time when sales had dwindled and then that happened years later. You know, it happened when probably in 2011, it got to the point where Serious Clothing was doing great for probably 10, 12 years. It enabled us to buy this building. We bought this building in 2000, moved in in 2001. We'd built our dream live workspace. Accidentally fell into the film location business, purely organically, by an article in the LA Times. They were doing a study on adaptive reuse of former industrial buildings and people living in creative spaces in LA. As was one of the featured lofts. About two weeks later, we got a phone call from a location company saying, would we be interested in renting the building for a music video? Now, myself and my wife, Karen, at the time, girlfriend at the time, um, we'd lived downtown for 10 years before that, and we'd seen them film everything, Batman, Terminator, Gone in 60 yeah. Seconds, all in this neighborhood where they've been filming for the past 40 years, 50 years. But because we'd never owned property, it never occurred to us that we could rent something and make a living out of filming. So we said, sure, yeah, no problem, you can rent the building, and it was another rap video. So <laughs> here's my rap connection right, continuing right. through. This one was a video for Missy Elliott with an artist called Tweet. And this is, wow, it's 2000, it's 18 years ago. And it was kind of the best and worst first thing we ever did. Because I was pretty naive. We gave an inch and they took a mile. And I'll tell you the 20 hours of my intro into the film location business. Started on a Friday morning at 6 a.m. I didn't know what a site rep was. So I'm the guy running around trying to set up the film crew thing and at two in the afternoon, they said, hey, can we shoot a little segment in that office over there? I'm like, sure, no problem. I figure what goes around comes around, right? Yeah. So four hours later, there's an additional 50 people. There. I'm like, what is going on? Who are all these people? They go, oh, we're shooting a, a Verizon cell phone tying commercial on the back end of the video. I go, no one told me about that. I you know, just thought they were shooting another scene from the video. So that was lesson number one. Lesson number two came around 10 p.m. at nighttime when they said, hey, I want to do a little nightclub setup. Can we shoot in your garage? And back then I didn't have as many cars, so I moved five or six cars out of the garage and they shot this little segment. Now, nothing's ever a little segment in a music right. video. Long story short, by 2 p.m., remember it started at 6 a.m. in the morning. I've been up 20, 20 hours at this point. I'm completely over it. I'm like, you know what? You guys need to be done out of here. You know, I don't care. It was a 12-hour contract. We're into overtime. Finally, I got them all out, went to bed, I think, around 4 a.m. So I'd been up 22 hours. And I said to Karen, you know what? Wow, I'll never do that again. You know, what a nightmare that was. Well, we let the dust settle, and probably two days later when we realized how much money we'd made in that one 22-hour shoot, we were like, wow, I guess we'll do that again. That was our intro yeah. to the film location business. But that happened organically from an article in the LA Times. But the common thread separate of the style that goes between my 30 years of history in LA is I tend to say yes more than I say no to things that 
seem like an opportunity. The film location business, we never ever thought about it. So for the next two, well, for the next three years, we were selectively filming in the building because at the time we lived in the building. So it was kind of a pain to have to wait for a production company to break down or, you know, we started renting a hotel for a night or two, but with two cats and a dog, that was a challenge. So by 2004, three, four years into the building and probably doing 12, 14, 18 days of film in a year, we did this Bruce Willis film called The Whole Ten Yards with Amanda Pete and Matthew Perry. And that was another pivotal turning point because they're in the building. They filmed in January of 2004, so it was 14 years ago. And they were here for a month. Paid us a boatload of dough, relocated us to a house in the Hollywood Hills for a month and shot this film. And the light bulb flash, we were like, wow, I bet if we didn't live in the building, we'd film all the time. So we'd never planned that. You know, yeah. the film business for us was a little fun hobby. So in 2004, we took the leap of faith to move out of the building for three months. Now, 14 years later, I've never moved back in. Once we moved out, we went from part-time filming, that 12, 14, 18 days a year, to at our peak, well over 120 days a year. We started doing reality shows, such as America's Next Top Model, American Idol, The Contender, and we used to do two of those a year for the next five, six years. And they'd be here for 40, 50 days per show. And then in between, we'd do music videos, commercials, uh, TV shows, crime drama, still shoots, uh, music videos. So that leap of faith of moving out of the building turned the film location business from a part-time hobby into a full-time job. And that enabled me to have more Porsches than I ever thought I'd owned. Probably six to eight years later into that, it also enabled us to close down serious clothing. The film, the film business was pretty lucrative and it was fun because you never know who's going to walk through that door. Right. You know, I got to meet quite a lot of my idols such as Lemmy from Motorhead and Van Halen and Joe Walsh from the Eagles who were doing stuff here, shooting music videos. So even though we weren't really part of it, they were in our environment and a few interesting things happened in the sense of that little kid growing up in England going to heavy metal shows at 13, 14, 15, I'd go backstage to meet the band and it was always what I would call on their turf and you'd wait in line, shake hands with the band, get your program signed, say great show and move on. Yeah. And it's funny because in 2000 and when was it? 84, 24? In 2004 we did this thing with Van Halen where they were here in the building and it was almost like the tables had turned in a sense because they were in my space, my environment, instead of me being backstage trying to meet them. They were shooting an album cover here and they were intrigued by what I was doing. So I had this rock and roll moment of Eddie Van Halen playing my guitar upstairs in the kitchen. I'm like, how did I get here? You know, I'd showed them this program of the Monsters of Rock Festival that I attended in England in 1984. And that was like Van Halen's first big breakthrough gig, 1984. They were on top of the world. I had the program. I had Eddie Van Halen sign the program. He signed my guitar. And that was what was great about the film industry is you get to meet these people that you sort of grew up idolizing, but all of a sudden you're having a conversation with them more than just great show. He's playing my guitar. We're talking about cars. And, yeah. you know, they're interested in my story. It's like, how did that happen, you know? So that was what was great about the film business. And my rambling story is basically going to peak with, you know, around 2010, the serious clothing sales started dwindling by that point. You know, I'm in my 40s. We're not going out anymore. And Karen and I always said, you know, we personally design what we like to wear. That hadn't changed from when I was designing stuff on the boardwalk in Venice. But by that time, we weren't going out to clubs three days a week and we weren't in the scene like we were. So, of course, the passion had left. And I always talk about passion. And so the last probably two years of that time period, sales started dwindling and we knew we had to change, but we built up this business. Basically our friends were working with us. It had become like a family business and we didn't want to shut it down because we didn't want to let these people go and have to basically, you know, um, let them go and they would be without a job. So we were struggling for a little bit. You know, those periods of the series clothing from 2010, 2011 were not great, but the film location business was good. So that yeah. enabled us to sort of coast a little bit. And then finally it got to the point of, wow, success. And I say it all the time, success to me means is the freedom to do whatever you want to do. So why are we doing this clothing company that we're no longer passionate about that is actually losing money and we hate it? You know, we weren't motivated, we weren't creative. 
So we said, you know what, we're just going to stop doing it. We didn't sell it. We just stopped doing trade shows. We fulfilled all our orders. You know, Serge and Karina are still with me. They transferred into, you know, the different next level that came, which was the film location business. But the interesting point that I'm getting around to is we'd wanted to pull that Band-Aid off for about two years, i.e. Uh, closing down series clothing. And then finally when we did it, it was like a weight off our shoulders, but we didn't know what was going to come next. Well, six months later, I got an email from this Canadian guy called Timir Moscovici. He said he wanted to make a short YouTube documentary that was going to be three to five minutes long. I thought, well, how bad can this be? Yeah. He's going to come down to L.A. And it was at his passion project. And he flew, the story is great because he flew down on frequent flying miles, hired a very talented crew in L.A. for a pennies on the dollar who happened not to be working. It was all unscripted. We filmed for four days. For me, it was the first time I'd ever been in front of a camera. For me, it was just a great experience. And after four days, he ended up with like 20 hours of footage. And nine months later, it became the 32-minute documentary film. Now, that film was released October uh, 15, 2012, so a little over five years ago. The past five years of my life have been a roller coaster ride. I haven't changed, but the opportunities have changed for me and Tamir. Tamir went on to have a flush, uh, flourishing career as a commercial film director, doing car commercials for Audi and Porsche and Ford and Chevy. And I was able to travel all over the world. But the point of the story was, if we hadn't closed down the day job, Serious Clothing, I wouldn't have the time to essentially travel all over pursuing this out of control Porsche hobby that has led to some really spectacular things, a relationship with Porsche, doing great stuff with Hot Wheels and Momo and Pirelli and Mobile One and various other things and getting to share my story with people like yourself. So by closing that one door to serious clothing, it freed up all the time in the world for me to essentially go on the next chapter of my life, which is, you know, where we're at right now. Yeah. So that's a long answer to, you know, these sort of dark times of what's coming next. You don't always know. But I always had the belief that I knew something would come. I didn't know what it would be, but I knew something would come. What's the reason behind your motivation? It's easy to, to lose uh, motivation. What's, what's been your drive? I think the key is always trying to move forward. It's like, I, I can think of certain things like what I spoke about in the film about making those evil can evil pants. It was a challenge I set for myself. When it comes to Porsches, it's, I'm a goal-orientated collector. It's nothing to do with value or money. It's like I'm daily driving that 924 Turbo. I'm on this quest to own one of everything Porsche's ever made in a sports car. Front engine, mid engine, rear engine, air and water cooled. It's nothing to do with what's trendy. It's just something inside. It's a goal that I set for myself, you know, that I'm trying to reach that goal. So I'm motivated by personal goals, which may be, you know, just getting a better 924 or you know, building a faster Porsche or just... It's not a bad goal. You know, inspiring myself. It's always, it's like the band that puts out a, a great album. You've always got to do the next one slightly better. It's like for me, I don't need to build a lot of cars I build for myself. I turn down customer builds all the time. But for me, the goal is always to sort of try and evolve and make the next one a little bit more interesting. Not necessarily faster, but just more interesting. And as my taste and priorities change, they evolve. You know, so for right now, my goal is make the most out of every moment, which right now is travel and opportunities and sharing my story with other people. Magnus, what is your definition of success? Success is the freedom just to get up and go. Certain things are really freeing, like not having to worry about what you left behind. And for me, when I travel, I disconnect. You know, it's like the world may end, but I'm in my own little world. And whether that's good or bad, that's the phase that I'm going through right now on this journey of life. So freedom to me is the ability to do whatever you want to do when you want to do it. I.e., let's say you said to me tomorrow, let's go to Kuwait. I'm like, okay, I got my passport. Yeah. Let's go. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Nothing's tying me down to here. Yeah. So I think that comes, you know, for me, I'm in this phase of the next chapter of my life, the journey. Life's always evolving and you have to make the most out of every moment. And I can't sit still and sort of wait for stuff. You know, I have to do what makes me happy. And right now that is the freedom of travel. So freedom to me is the opportunity to do whatever you want to do at a moment's notice. Beautiful. What's one message you'd like to leave the viewers with? 
My message is always pretty simple when it comes to that type of question is find something you love to do, do it to the best of your ability, stay motivated, dedicated, never give up, always ask people for advice. I didn't get where I am I'm by doing it on my own. I had a team around me you know, who enabled me and I still have that team. It's a small team. It's Karina and Serge. They basically run the film location business that allows me to travel. So for me, surround yourself with people that know more than you know. Don't be afraid of failure. Be motivated and never give up. Thank you, Magnus. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.